Good afternoon. Um, I'm suddenly on the other side. That feels a little funny. <clears throat> so first of all, thank you for having me. Um, so I, I, I need to make three, admit to three things. The first is, this is a theory talk, but it has very few equations. Um, the second, um, I say this is in cooperative arrays, and not everything that I'm talking about is in arrays, but to a large degree. And the third thing is, after when I when I listened to to all of the talks in the morning, I figured I should have structured my talk all completely different, which of course I didn't change now. So I'm I'm now a little bit nervous. So forgive me, it fits that well. Okay, so. Um, um, I'm talking about cooperativity, and cooperativity is really at the center of all of this. Um, so the first cooperativity was this old paper by Dickey um, nearly 70 years ago, actually 70 years ago by now, um, um, who came up with the idea of super radiance. And um, then people kind of feverishly tried out all kind of super radiance, which at some point in the um, um, 30 years later resulted in this very famous review by Gross and Tarosh. And um, up to very recently, this was still um, the important piece of work on super radiance. Um, now, of course, we have ChatGPT for this, right? <laughs> Um, it's actually surprisingly correct what it says about super radiance. I'm otherwise not. So let me give you a very, very small um, the overview of our cooperativity from the point of view of super radiance. And I wasn't here yesterday. If you have seen that already, it will take only a couple of seconds. So the idea is um, if we have a single two-level atom, this will decay. Um, probabilistically with an intensity that average kind of decays exponentially over time. If we do the same thing um, for, for two atoms that are independent, if we look, if we measure intensity over time, that doesn't change, it's exactly the same. But if we have two atoms that are so close together that they, that they, um, that basically the first one um, stimulates the decay of the second one, and they decay coherently. I don't know what that is. Something is something doesn't work very well here. A coherent um, superposition of these two photons, and the intensity over time changes a little bit. And if we do that with a lot of atoms, then we will see that the change is rather dramatic, and we have this this initial kind of burst of radiation comes out, which is which is typically seen as the sign of super radiance signature. Um, and um, um, this super radiance, um, the, the, it, at, at the strongest time, the decay rather than proportional to n goes proportional to uh, n squared and leads to the so-called build up of collective dipoles, which is a little bit of a misnomer, but I'm not going into this. But what, what really happens on the microscopic, in, um, on the microscopic level here is the dipole-dipole interaction. And the way how the dipole-dipole interaction shows up in super radiance is as this flip-flop interaction where we, where, where the, the, the two atoms that, that are close by, um, exchange their, um, exchange their excitation. Um, and this is basically at the core of all of the super radiance, of all the cooperative effects, et cetera. And it has this typical kind of complicated dipole-dipole interaction, um, which depends on 1 over r to the 3, 1 over r to the 2, et cetera, and a lot of angles and directions, et cetera. So it's complicated. I'm never going to even write this explicitly, but please remember for the rest of the talk that this is always what is in the, at the um, at the basis of what I'm going to talk about. So one more general picture. So if we go away from Dicke, um, Dicke looks only at the fully symmetric ladder of states. So here we take all the two to the n states and divide them into, um, into um, angular momentum manifolds. And here um, we see already um, 
um, the decay always goes, that's the yellow, um, the yellow arrows, the decay, super radiant decay goes vertical, and the dipole dipole interaction that we are looking at is still considerably weaker than the distance between two levels. So this basically couples two, um, the, two degenerate levels. I don't know what, what, is, what is wrong here, but well. Um, and so what happens is that everything which goes along the, the purple is slow and everything which goes along the, the yellow goes fast. And um, so eventually for all of these manifolds, but they, ugh, what I wanted to say um, is that, that all of these manifolds, except for the Dicke manifold, now have a lowest state that is actually not the ground state. And so, um, one, of course, over time, the system will get out, but only on the slow time scale of the dipole, dipole interaction. So this is basically um, what, what subradiance traditionally is about. So we are in a superposition of all of these superposition states where, where we have a, a decay channel that destructively interfere. Okay, and so we get subradiance. So, um, now we go into, oh, now this doesn't work anymore, it's, it's just frustrating. Perhaps I do use that one after all. What we are starting with is this 2D array of atoms. You can just imagine that as two level atoms, um, where they have a, a, a lattice constant that is of the order or a little bit smaller than, than, than the wavelengths of the transition. And um, this wavelength of the transition is very important because in general one assumes that this is where the dipole-dipole interaction actually kicks in and gives these effects in a visible way. Um, and what you see here, these little kind of circles basically give the reason why, because um, um, the cross-section for an atom um, with respect to the resonant frequency is about lambda squared. Right? So that means with, with A equals lambda, we roughly meet the limit where, where the cross sections tile the plane. So what we would expect in this case is that we, if we send light in from a normal, um, from a normal direction, that we can potentially get complete reflection in that case. And it turns out that is indeed the case. <clears throat> and it turns out that is exactly the case for two particular ratios, which on resonance are exactly 0 0.2 and 0 0.8. If we go away from, from, from resonance, it goes somewhere else. Um, we actually can nicely explain why. It's a very simple explanation, but I will forego it today anyway, I'm just telling you. And so this is a nice artistic kind of um, picture of that, that, that Effie Shamoon, who, who was the postdoc who did this work to start with, made. Please do note, still all cooperative resonances, the 0 0.2, 0 0.8 is because of cooperativity. The second effect that you see in the same arrays is if you look at the band structure, that kind of polaritons on the surface have. Um, here you see three pictures, uh, there are three colors, the three colors are the three different polarizations, um, also coming from different directions. And what you see here in particular is um, a part that is inside the light cone, and the part inside the light cone um, is the one where the wave number on the surface is smaller than the wave, line, wave number in the vacuum, which consists of x, y, and z. Surface is only x and y. So that means that always everything which is in the light cone can couple to the vacuum. Everything what is outside the light cone, however, um, is energetically forbidden from coupling to the vacuum. And therefore, if we have any excitations that are outside of the light cone, they live in principle on this forever. Okay, I say in principle because there are of course so many effects that can happen. So what we can do then is we can in principle um, now play around with this reflectivity plus the surface waves and kind of do all kind of nice things. And um, a lot of that um, I'm, I'm just skipping. I'm, I'm, I'm going towards a, in particular, kind of nonlinear. But first of all, I would like to very briefly show what the imp possible implementations are. The first one is having atoms in optical lattices, which is kind of a fairly obvious um, 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 effect and was actually 
originally the thing that gave us the idea to even look into this. And here's a picture, this is from Markus Greiner's lab. Um, and in the meantime, um, also quite a while ago, there was a, an, um, an experiment in Emanuel Bloch's group where they showed this and they also went on to show some of the subsequent things. Alternatively, one could also go into solid state, like for example, these, these um, uh, transition metal dichalcogenides, because they are naturally two-dimensional and naturally nicely ordered. There are, of course, some kind of tricks about this, but I'm not going into detail about that. Um, the nice thing is that, that actually Hong Kun and Philip and also Misha at the same time actually had some experiments where they showed some of this mirroring effects in this case as well. Okay, so there are a lot of applications of that and I'm not going to talk about all of them. So I'm kind of selected three or three and a half. So the first is if we now take this, um, take this arrays and put an impurity into it, it is a little bit like if you take an atom and put it in the cavity. This is why I called this basically QED to start with because it's really very similar. Um, and so let's go back to the single um, cross section of a single atom, which is of the order of lambda squared. What if I want to make this cross section much bigger, and in particular as big as the whole array? Right. That's that's the goal now. Um, so the question is, can I actually do this? So um, we just tried this out numerically first, um, and in order to to kind of give you a feeling of how this goes. Um, the first one is the, the, um, the picture of the scattering intensity of an, of an atom, which I call impurity, of an atom only, um, which with a near field effect that goes up to, to, to twice um, the, the far field. And so we gauge this one to be intensity equal to two. So everything is relative to that. Um, in the array case, we don't have the impurity, we only have the array, and here we get this scattering off, um, obviously in a standing wave, and this kind of um, 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 constructively interferes to a total intensity of four. And now we put the two together. And here what you see is that you get first a very interesting pattern, and second that you get an intensity that is considerably, considerably higher. And actually if you zoom in, closer to this impurity atom, you will see that this is even higher. So what that does that tell us? That tells us that basically whatever kind of, um, however we, we put radiation, and the radiation is of course at that point kind of um, at most full photon, anywhere on the array will be pretty much immediately move towards the impurity. So it is basically like an antenna array. Um, so this is the classical picture um, where these dipoles of these array atoms act like, like this dipole in the antenna array. But in the, in the, um, for the quantum, there is something in addition. First of all, we have the impurity chosen such that it's just on the outskirts of just not being resonant anymore with the array atoms, such um, that um, only virtual excitation of the array atoms is possible if we are in resonant with the impurity. But nevertheless, it's still because the array atoms are a lot, are such that, that the, the photon interacts with the array quite a lot. And so what happens is that you send some light on that and that basically immediately acts on the, on the <laughs> this, this was not visible, it basically immediately collects on the impurity here. So that's, that's the idea. Um, this one is a little bit hard to, to measure. Um, this is what, what, you, what you so far saw were just numerical kind of measurements. But we can have two of them, right? These two impurities are exactly the same and they sit at different points in the array. And one way to measure that, if that really works as perfectly as I kind of seem to imply before. And um, what should happen is that I start with one of them excited 
and the other one in the ground state, and then I just let it go, and whatever the first one loses goes into the second, right? So what I would expect is a coherent um, population exchange between these atoms. Um, and um, um, the question, the next question is how can I actually quantify that in a number? And um, they, we can de define a quality factor, which is just a, a ratio between the coupling strength between the impurities uh, versus the decay in two space. And um, this is very similar if you look at that as, a, as the definition of, a, of a, um, um, the quality factor in, in, a, in a cavity. And if we do that, this is basically what we see. So here you see that this, this should say population and this should say time, I'm sorry. So um, what you see is the population on impurity one and impurity two, and they seem to go into something like Rabi oscillations, which are slowly decaying. And then you can look at, at the, and I should show the whole thing. Um, this, this is in two different regimes, and here the quality factor is still only like a hundred or so here it's about a million and here are the, the these are two also two slightly different setups here um, you can see for which parameter regions and here on the x-axis we have the lattice constant as a fraction of the of the wave um, length and on the y-axis in both cases we have the detuning between the lattice and the um, and the impurity and here we see that we have regions where um, we can basically go up to a million for this quality factor. So that means we have, in principle, really, really high per cell factor for, for, this, for this decaying impurity. Um, interestingly, there are also um, regions, the dark blue regions, where we basically have exactly the opposite, where we basically go four orders of magnitude less coupled than we would have in, in, in free space. So, um, in order to show how well that works, we thought up a little bit of a, an on-array quantum computer. Um, I'm not suggesting any of you builds a quantum computer this way, but in principle one could do it. Um, um, where, where, or an on, on array network or so, where you can really take these, these impurity atoms um, as, as um, qubits. Um, in order to do that, you would have to add at least another level um, because you need something for control. Um, so what in fact you need is a switch of on and off, uh, whether it actually communicates with the array or not. You need a single qubit rotation, and um, in order to implement both of that, you add a third level and use the, the ideas of EIT. And this one is written up, and we have shown that one can basically do a, a universal set of gates and kind of made an estimate of how the quality factor is, etc. But this is kind of a toy model and basically tells you how well, in principle, this works. Um, what is hopefully a little bit more serious application of that is to use the same idea for metrology. So here is the idea. I need to go a step a little bit back here. Um, so what one gets if one looks only at the impurity atoms and traces over the array atoms is a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. It's the easiest description of that and it actually works also very well. Um, and there are, um, if you have a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, it does not necessarily have the full set of eigenvalues, and the eigenvalues also can become um, um, uh, complex. And then there is this idea of, um, of exceptional points. Exceptional points are these points in parameter space where we get, um, a, um, where we go from, from um, let's say two eigenvalues into one eigenvalue um, where the real power at the same part, at the same point um, it gets from zero to non-zero. And um, traditionally or for a while people were super interested in this in this exceptional point because this bifurcation usually goes with a square root dependence. And the square root dependence has this, has the advantage um, that it has at the exceptional point a diverging slope. That means you should think theoretically this is super, super sensitive to any parameters. 
And so people were really interested in that for sensing, except that none of that really works, because even if you have even the slightest bit of noise, um, what you get is basically more, uh, more of um, a, a form like this. This still bifurcates, etc., but the slope here is actually rather moderate and is not really very interesting for sensing. Um, so when we, when we went through the same history, we thought, oh, exceptional points, great, we can use this for sensing. And then we figured, oh, these exceptional points, other people have tried this before, it all doesn't work, right? Um, and then we started really working. And it turns out, uh, this is um, why, why we would, um, where the noise comes from, the, from the cooperative effect. But it turns out, and I think we were not the only ones who found this, um, the nonlinearity which leads the system to have exceptional points also more often enough leads to nonlinearity that actually has some really high sensitivity. It's just not at the exceptional point, but it's the same type of nonlinearity. And the rest of this I will just show you um, um, and just the idea. So what we found is um, um, that, that, this, that our system is actually super sensitive to whether these two impurities are actually in resonance with each other. Okay, so that's the question. How can we test this? Well, um, here are these two impurities. We excite the one and detect the population on the other. That's basically the same kind of Rabi type or Rabi looking oscillations that I showed you before. Um, and what we get if we are, and this is actually a pretty lousy example, but it, it, it's, it's easier to visualize what we are doing. So if we are on resonance, we get a nearly full exchange of population, okay? If we are not on resonance, the exchange of population is much, much worse, and also the oscillations are much faster, okay? And this, both of this can be used to, to detect, and I, did the same, the same picture again. Here, um, the, the black ones are basically what is blue here, and the blue and the orange ones is what is, what the small oscillations are here. Um, and what we are, um, um, what we are looking at is now the height of the maximum of the second, if a population of the second impurity. And that we can translate now into a picture um, where, we, where we see how much is the maximum population versus the detuning between the two impurities. And if you look at this, this is for the different colors are for different lattice constants. And if you look at that, you see that these, these lines, they can actually become exceptionally narrow. And um, Um, so the question was whether we can do this. This is actually, I'm sorry, I, I, I showed one picture. I did not show one picture that I showed I have in here. So the idea is that we, that, that, that one really kind of zooms in here and, and measures this. Uh, we actually, we have a paper, um, which, which is the one I <laughs> cite here. Um, that was done with, with um, Stefan Ostermann, who is here in Oliver Sandberg, who was a visiting um, student. Um, and and um, we have this all analytically, so it's very nice, um, but it's, it's not, not yet posted, and all the pictures are not easy to understand. So um, what you see here is basically the full width of half maximum in terms of impurity line widths and, 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 um, as, a, as a function of the lattice constant and of the measurement time. And as you can see, um, if you somehow try to, oops, sorry, um, try to zoom in somewhere here, you can actually get pretty narrow line widths. Another thing which is of importance for, for, um, for experimental um, aspects is that we have, um, that this of course assumes that we have perfect array and perfect placements of our impurities, which of course one normally doesn't have. Right? So um, either the, the impurities are not really placed quite that well, then the line gets bad, or the array is not placed that nice, then the, then the line gets bad. But what one can do, one can actually re-gauge the system by, by changing the, the, the tuning of one of those, and one can typically nearly reconstitute the original kind of narrow line width. So this, this means, in principle, this should even work for 
for. So now I'm, I'm basically, I'm, let me, I, I have two more applications. I will talk only about one because I don't have that much time. So this is completely different and goes away from the arrays, but still has the atoms sitting regularly and close enough that, that they have this dipole dipole interaction. So, what we are looking at is chirality. Um, and let me just briefly give you the background. Um, this is um, work that is actually done with Jonah, who is here, and, and Stefan. And um, the starting point was the so called cis or chiral induced spin cell activity effect, which tells that chiral molecules, um, like these helices here, can actually. Um, act as an efficient spin filter for electrons. Why is that so interesting? So there was a paper last year where, they, where people asked, is that potentially the origin for homochirality in life? And um, in particular, findings in meteorite suggest the same preference for one chirality as the life on Earth, right? So it has to come from somewhere than just interactions of chiral molecules on, in, on Earth. And then our thought was, well, light is basically the best thing that is omnipresent in the universe, and there is a known asymmetry in photon polarization in the, in the galaxy. So could that be the actual origin for this homochirality? And if so, how can the homochirality even be broken using photons, okay? Do we, in particular, need time reversal symmetry breaking? which has a lot to do with chiral symmetry. So the idea is, our idea is very simple. Um, our chiral uh, geometry is this helix with these atoms kind of at, along the helix. And in order to couple to, to, to photon polarizations, um, we, we assume the, the, the atoms all to be these V-type atoms with one left and one right circularly polarized transition. Um, and so uh, this is what I just said. Um, what we do is then we start down here with an excitation and analyze photon transport along the helix. And if we have high transport, that means there's a preferential population in either this up, what we call the spin up or spin down state. Um, and if we look at this transport, then we see that we indeed get, um, so this red and blue curve are the two different kind of photon polarizations. Um, according to this red and blue that you see here. And you see that they are, there's indeed a, a symmetry here. And here this breaks, this is actually where it ends to, it reaches the end of the helix and turns around. And then, because then the, the chirality goes the opposite way, um, these, these two curves actually kind of change place. So this is exactly what we would, what we would expect. Um, to go a little bit deeper into that, um, we can we look at the at the band structure. What you see on the first glance is that there is actually a, a, a band gap, and yes, indeed, there is actually also a, um, a topological um, a topological face attached to this to this to this um, bands on the top and the and the bottom. And what you also see, if you look a little bit closer is that um, the, the, the diamonds, like this one here, for example, means spin down, and the, the squares mean spin up. So there is a, a, um, um, not a symmetry among all spin downs, and not a symmetry between all spins up, but there's a symmetry between spin up and spin down, which is a, which is a, um, which is a sign of, of spin orbit coupling, and here this is an emergent spin orbit coupling. Here I need to say something which I should have said one or two slides ago. Namely, we look here only at the electric part of the light field. Um, because, um, because we were really interested whether the geometry alone without a B field can give emergent spin orbit coupling and this, this, this kind of chirality. And for that, the, 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 the B field of the electromagnetic field would, would kind of be a little bit of a red herring. So we just ignored this. And what we see, we indeed get um, chirality in emergent spin orbit coupling without breaking of time reversal symmetry when, uh, with, with a zero magnetic field. And finally, I just, um, we have thought a little bit about where we, um, how one could potentially do such an experiment. Um, they are, um, the, the best 
our best bet right now are 3D holographic tweezer arrays with strontium, which is actually something that people can do already. And um, um, there is actually some work by the group of Olga Stinnera in Berlin um, who have also looked at similar, at similar effects. So there are two um, references. And of course, at the end, the question is, does that actually really have a role? I say in nature, but in the universe. Um, um, we have started looking into the non-trivial topological properties where one really has to go a little bit deeper into geometry. Um, and what I forgot here to write for some reason, we want to do that for real molecules, and this is what we are working on right now. And then um, this non-trivial topological properties and looking what the complete symmetry classes in that case um, are is, is basically and, and since I'm over time, I think I will just stop here. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, are there questions? Just a quick question. Uh, if I understand, uh, if I recall correctly, when you were showing your metrology results, when it was showing uh, like nonlinearity and use sensitivity uh, as you're yeah. changing the lattice mm -hmm. constant or the lambda, in fact, you, uh, after a certain point, it actually broadened again if, uh, on your plot, like the A, the smallest yes, A. Yes, yes, that's right. So, so the it's the, there is an optimal A. Okay. It's not the A gets smaller and smaller and right. it gets better and better. And for, for this, for the, I don't remember, typically around like 0 0.1, 0 0.15 or so is. So uh, what sets the, this threshold or the um, crossover? It's a, it's, it's actually, I mean, I, I can, I can tell you the, the exact, because it's very nonlinear, it's kind of just a maximum in a, in a relatively complicated nonlinear function. Sorry, this is a little bit unsatisfactory, but it's the best answer that I can quickly give you. Other questions? I you still have a couple of minutes, maybe if you want to. I, I'm happy to kind of give, perhaps not, um, I don't know, I, I can give the, the, next, the next part of the talk. Uh, <laughs> it was the last application. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, okay, I, I will give the last application. Um, because this is at least somewhat similar, um, because we are also going away from this kind of array structure into a ring structure. So here, um, what we are looking at is something roughly like that. We have rings of atoms, again, you just, just two-level atoms, um, which are a handful of rings, typically like between five and ten. And they are, for example, in a line. We also look at the end in an array, but the line is mostly what we are looking at. And of course, one of the interesting kind of things to look at is to compare that with, for example, photosynthetic kind of complexes and how to make them in artificial kind of photon catching devices. Um, so the question is here um, that we want A to understand the fundamental quantum processes. Um, and also um, the second thing is that we try to kind of understand transport from the following minimum assumptions. Um, that first we have this excitation hopping. This is this kind of flip-flop interaction that I talked about in the beginning. And again, as I said, this is two-level systems. And the main question is here, how well can we transport, how fast can we transport, and how does the transport work at all? Um, so here is a, is a um, one of these setups. So the way how we are thinking about that is we have these rings, and we have one donor where we have an atom in the middle that's actually, despite the different color, the same type of atom that we have around here, and one acceptor. And um, the, the, they are all the same. The acceptor is a little bit different because we need somewhere um, to kind of collect the, the excitations afterwards. So we made a third level here, which is basically the trap. Uh, that one basically, whatever goes into the trap doesn't come out anymore. Um, and, um, and the first thing is, um, why are rings interesting? So let's just look at transport from the donor to the acceptor um, for different, for different um, um, geometries. 
And here we look just at the ring chain and at the ring lattice. And what we see is that um, the black line is if we just have the same distance, which is about a wavelength um, through free space versus um, the, the same thing through this ring chain or ring lattice, which you see works similarly well. And it actually, the maximum is similarly good. But here, what we have on the x-axis is how strong is this kind of trapping transition, um, this extra kind of level. So um, if that is relatively strong, it's not very surprising that this works very well. But it turns out that with the rings, that works very well, even if our track strength is actually very weak. And so we have a very broad, um, broad range of where this works. Um, we also have added a little bit of disorder, and the disorder is actually pretty big for the third and kind of moderate for the second picture. So now let's look at the same pictures, but for other geometries. Um, and the closest are hexagonal lattice and honeycomb lattice, and if you look, they are both kind of compared, doing pretty lousy compared to the, to the rings. Um, again, we can make a, we can make a, 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 a band structure, and here the, the, the color of the bands are, is how the, the light one are super radiant and the dark one are sub radiant. So the sub radiant ones is the ones that we want because we don't want the excitation kind of being lost in space, right? They should please go to the acceptor. Um, but what we get in addition is actually an edge state. That was a little bit of a surprise in this case. So the edge state, if you kind of look at this, how this looks like, this is roughly like this. You have basically a population um, with the very end and the, and, the, and the very beginning and the very end. And um, now let's look which of the states actually, whether it's these edge states or the other states, do the best transport. What comes out is actually not very surprising. Um, namely, the best transport is done by all the other states, which are not the edge states, which is basically done in blue. But the thing is that takes a while. So this is times in, in natural decay rate of our two level atoms. And this is the, the, the efficiency of the transport. And so how much does end up at the end in the acceptor? So if we look at the edge states, they perform very badly. But what we see if they perform at all, they are really very fast. They are really orders and orders of magnitude faster. Okay, why? At the end, it's basically because we get tunneling um, um, from, this, from this very early to the very late state. So, so potentially this edge state might actually have a very strong role to play. And there's actually kind of a couple of old papers where, where, where people in a very different context basically look at, look at edge state um, transport. And then um, one, one can also let me leave that out and, and just, just be done with this. I think this is enough for today. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay. How to give two talks yeah. in one talk slot. Okay. Well, now, now there are more questions. Now that we don't have much time, we want to see yeah, just quickly. So um, in this case where you showed where you have a single impurity atom and you have this case where the quality factor goes down massively, uh -huh. does that mean that the emission into free space is enhanced and yeah. could one use this yeah. as a readout yeah. for the impurity? In a sense, yes, you could do that. Yes, exactly. Okay, two questions. The first one, the the first one is why do you choose a ring instead of just an atom? Like, why? What like does this ring structure yeah. brings? The second one, your edge modes. Uh, there was an asymmetry, and normally yeah. I would expect like a, a equal superposition. So, um, the 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 first question is, um, they um, some some of this 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 pictures that I showed here, let me just briefly go back that far, um, you have um, also the line, um, ha, sorry, that, that, got, that got crowded out. Um, we also looked for a line, the line actually performs worse than all the others. Um, the reason why we started to look into rings is, exact, is because um, um, other people, in particular Helmut Rich's group, they found before that if you have an atom in the middle of a ring, 
it makes an extremely good donor or acceptor because it sits exactly at the, at the super radiant focus of the rings. So the rings in principle in order to combine transport with, with this kind of donor and acceptor property work particularly well. And then we just said, okay, let's look at the transport into rings, whether that works very well. The advantage of the rings is that we have A, a directionality, but nevertheless the opportunity to, for, for, for different pathways to, to, to interfere. So it sounds kind of promising, but at the end we just needed to try it out and really look at the, at the eigenmodes. Um, the reason why our, why our edge mode is is, um, looks asymmetric is just that we look at a certain time, which, how, how it's, how it's actually occupied at this particular time. So this is, I think, might be a little bit of a misleading picture, so. Okay. All right. So let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>